clinical applications of strain imaging. So with sustained innovation of echocardiography, speckle tracking imaging was introduced in the field of echo after live 3D echo was introduced. That is around the, in the year of 2010. So what is the strain? The strain or deformation is the change of shape and dimensions of cardiac muscle in relation to original length during cardiac cycle. Shortening of the fiber during systole results in a negative value for strain, while lengthening results in a positive value for strain. Here is a schematic presentation for measurement of strain. A strain or fiber length change at end systole compared to its length at end diastole and expressed as a percentage. So there are four principal types of strain, longitudinal, radial, circumferential, rotational, and tooth strain. Here is an animation demonstrating how strain are calculated. For calculation of the longitudinal strain, we select apical views. Here you can see the apical four chamber view and for calculation of the radial and circumferential strain, we select the short axis view. And speckles, that is the white dots or kernels with the mar within the myocardium are tracked. For longitudinal strain, speckles are tracked from base to apex to calculate the, to measure the longitudinal strain. Here on four chamber view, you will soon see that, okay, just, the normal uh, uh, longitudinal strain is represented by the bright red color followed by pale color in the basal and mid segment representing abnormal longitudinal strain. For calculation of the radial strain, speckles are tracked from the endocardium to epicardium. Actually, radial strain represents the thickening and thinning. And here, short axis view, you can see the normal radial strain, bright color followed by abnormal strain, the pale color. And for calculation of the circumferential strain, the speckles or white dots are checked along the perimeter of the short axis. This normal circumferential strain, bright color and pale color represent the abnormal circumferential strain. So these are the views for measurement of the LV and RV strain. Global longitudinal strain is the most validated one. And here is the bullseye flow showing that the Global peak systolic longitudinal strain is about minus 20%, which is considered as the normal value for GLS. Normal value are different for different type of strain, and it varies according to the vendors. Here is a simplified clinical application that by from both side plot, disease pattern can be recognized by seeing the lowered average GLS value, subclinical systolic dysfunction can be diagnosed, and from the strain curve shape, regional variation can be diagnosed. There are different chamber strain, LV strain, RV strain, LS strain, and R strain. We have our experience in the field of LV, RV, and R strain, and I will share with you about these strain parameters. So application of LV strain has in many different ways, but our experience is in the patient with coronary artery disease, detection of subclinical disease in the patients of systemic hypertension and in case of valvular heart disease. So in patients with coronary artery disease, we did 2D and 3D speckle tracking echocardiography. And in our first, in our first study, we um, did 2D ST to find out the utility of a speckle tracking echocardiography for detection of coronary artery disease with no regional one motion abnormality at rest. Summary of this study has been presented at the annual scientific conference of European Society of Cardiology and abstracts published in the European Heart Journal Supplement. In this study, we have found that the global peak systolic longitudinal strain showed a good sensitivity and a specificity for identification of significant coronary artery disease in patients with stable coronary artery disease without regional one motion abnormality at rest. We did another study using 3D speckle tracking echocardiography for identification of significant coronary artery disease in patients with non ST SCS using 3D spe speckle tracking echocardiography. And this study has been published in the Journal of Echocardiography in the year of 2018. In this study, 3D derived global peak systolic longitudinal strain showed good sensitivity and specificity for identifying of significant coronary artery disease in patients with non ST SCS. Here is an example of 3D image acquisition of a case. Multi slice 3D view shows that there was no regional transmission abnormality at rest. However, the 3D derived longitudinal strain, there was reduction in the strain parameter in the anteroceptor area, and CAG reveals significant stenosis in the LAD territory. 
We, uh, we have also experienced in the hypertensive patients for detection of subclinical cystic dysfunction. So we did 3D speculative tracking echocardiography in 70 hypertensive patients and in 35 healthy subjects. And 3D derived strain parameter, GLS, radial strain, and area strain was significantly reduced in patient with in hypertensive patient with and without hypertrophy compared to the control group. Though the ejection fraction was preserved in both groups, but the reduced strain parameter identified the subclinical systemic dysfunction in hypertensive patients. This study was presented in the IS China in the year of 2018. So we also have our experience in the field of valvular heart disease. We did speckle tracking echocardiography in the asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis patients. And this study has, has been presented recently in the ACC Middle East Congress, Cardiac Society Congress. And here, 46 patients with severe asymptomatic AS comprise the cases, uh, comprise the case group and 33 healthy subjects comprise the control group. And 3D derived all the strain parameters were significantly reduced in the cases compared to the control group. But the ejection fraction was preserved in both the group. So despite the presence of preserved ejection fraction, the strain parameters reduced and it identifies the subclinical systemic dysfunction in patients with severe asymptomatic aortic stenosis. Now we move to RV strain. RV strain has many clinical applications. It is a, uh, important for prognostication of heart failure, coronary artery disease, valvular heart disease, pulmonary hypertension, and RV strain is reliable to guide treatment in case of acute pulmonary hypertension and pulmonary embolism. In case of infiltrative disease, RV strain helps in early detection, risk stratification, and prognosis. We used RV strain in patients of heart failure with reduced ejection fraction to see the short-term outcome. Here, 115 cognitive patients with heart failure with reduced CF comprised the study population, along with the conventional echo parameters. 2D STA was done in all patients, and follow-up at six months was done over telephone about rehospitalization for heart failure and death. And we have found that abnormal RV free wall strain about independently and significantly pre predicted the short-term mortality or rehospitalization. We did another study in patients with CAD using RV strain. Here, 80 patients with acute inferior MI who underwent coronary angiogram comprised the study population along with the conventional echoparameter. 2DST was done in all patients and RV free wall strain analysis by 2DST was performed in all patients before coronary angiogram. So there were 47 patients who, who have RCA occluded proximal to RV branch and 33 patients with RCA occluded distal to RV branch. And we have found that RV free wall strain at, with a cutoff value of minus equal to more than minus 15.8 showed good sensitivity and specificity for identifying proximal RCA lesion. Now we move to the final experience of using the LA strain. Just recently, during the last year, we, we are doing LA strain in a patients, in group of patients who are at risk for LV diastolic dysfunction. So LA strain is important for prediction of atrial fibrillation. It is important for the assessment of LV failing pressure and an accurate predictor of the diastolic dysfunction. We did our study for the early detection of diastolic dysfunction for patients who are at risk for diastolic dysfunction. So all parameters of diastolic dysfunction and left atrial strain parameters are measured by 2D STE. And we, found, we have found that there is, first there is reduction in the septal and lateral annular E prime velocity, followed by there was change in the strain parameters, the reduction in LA strain parameters before the reduction of other parameters for diastolic dysfunction. And compared to the, in, the patients who were diagnosed as diastolic dysfunction by ASC and ESCVI 2016 criteria, in all patients, LA strain was reduced, but LAVI was increased in only five out of nine patients. Thus, we summarize our uh, findings in different study, and we can, we can conclude that LV strain is useful for identification of significant coronary artery disease, even in the absence of regional one motion abnormality. They're helpful for the identification of subclinic systolic dysfunction in, in hypertensive patients and asymptomatic severe AS. RV strain is useful for the 
prediction of short term outcome in patient with heart failure to reduce ejection fraction and it may help in the identification of proximal rca lesion and la strain is full in the early diagnosis of diastole dysfunction for the patient who are at risk of diastole dysfunction this it may help in the diagnosis of management of patient with heart failure at with preserved ejection fraction thus we may conclude that better patient selection for new therapies may rely on this new parameters to guide and improve patient care decision making thank you for your kind attention thank you thank you for giving a very very in a short time a complete information about the strain imaging which is coming up very much in clinical echocardiography nowadays and possibly it may be one of the next guidelines in valvular heart disease you may see strain also thank you we'll have a discussion later on so our next speaker professor kubri ujjaman he will talk on trans thoracic 2d echocardiographic assessment of mitral valve professor kubri ujjaman assalamu alaikum the distinguished audience faculties everyone have a very good morning so my topics is trans thoracic echocardiographic evaluation of pre surgical mitral valve vpr it's a pre surgical evaluation by trans thoracic echo which valves are amenable for repair i have reconstructed my or constructed my lectures keeping in mind the fellows and students so i have arranged uh, my topics on the basis of classification system of mitral valve lesion morphological characteristics of mitral valve mitral valve lesion suitable for repair and conclusion now there are two types of classification system that complements each other one is the on the basis of hemodynamic system that aids the mild moderate severe and it it evaluate the indication of surgery and another is the carpentier's functional classification of mitral valve lesion for assessment of valve repair so what is the hemodynamic classification up to 2008 it was mild moderate severe but from 2014 onward the staging system comes into practice but still now we are practicing the mild moderate severe in our lab so staging system is at risk progressive asymptomatic severe and severe and these are the parameters for determination of the hemodynamic severity of the mitral valve lesions among these parameters emergent lesion uh, jet area size of vena contractor and size of lv are usually practiced in day to day clinical life to determine the hemodynamic severity so these are the parameters for selection of the indication of the mitral valve surgery the severity of valve disease symptoms lv systolic function less than 60 lv end diastolic dimension systolic dimension more than 40 and progressive increase in lv size so what is the carpentier's functional classification of mitral valve lesion for assessment of valve repair actually the functional approach it depends upon the analysis of motion of the leaflets that is very important by echocardiography and direct inspection of the surgeon and the functional classification is the foundation of valve analysis it serves as a guideline to achieve a successful valve reconstruction and these are the types of functional classification type 1 valve dysfunction with normal leaflet movement type 2 valve dysfunction with excessive leaflet motion and type 3 valve dysfunction with restricted leaflet motion in type 1 the classical examples is cleft aml and leaflet perforation and vegetation these are some pictures and type 2 the prototype or classical example is myxomatous or degenerative mitral valve disease where the pathology lesions are the cordy rupture cordy elongation papillary muscle rupture papillary muscle elongation so these are some pictures of the cordy rupture cordy elongation cordy papillary muscle rupture papillary muscle elongation and these are the carpentier's classification type 3a prototype example is rheumatic heart disease where the systolic mo or motion of the leaflets is restricted both in systole and diastole and what are the lesions leaflet thickening commissural fusion cordy thickening cordy fusion and this is the what are the type 3 functional class the prototype example is ischemic heart disease here the lesions are calcification ventricular aneurysm ventricular fibrous plaque and ventricular dilatation now 
the segmental analysis has ref defined the originally imposed the the functional classification that was imposed by carpenters what is segment analysis both trans thoracic and trans esophageal echocardiography are used for to, for analysis of the valve motion and functional classification is redefined by addition of seg segmental analysis which allows precise location of leaflet dysfunction what are the segments these are the three scallops of pml three scallops of aml and two commissures of atrial uh, commissures anterolateral and posteromedial commissure and this is the picture you can see you can see the uh, these are the scallop scallops are determined by the indentation that is on the pml and entry most uh, p uh, location of the scallop is the p1 and corresponding portion of the aml is regarded as the a1 a2 and a3 and there are two commissures and for the surgeon this triangular shape structure is regarded as an commissural leaflet commissural leaflet and according to the repair it is very important for the surgeons but we by 2d we can not uh, we cannot assess the commissural leaflet so this is the trans thoracic echo how can you identify the scallops of the mitral valve in classical peristemal loisis view we can identify the p1 and p2 scallop in four chamber view you can identify the p1 a1 and a2 and two chamber view you can identify the p1 a2 and p3 and by trans esophageal echo these are the views that you can identify the uh, by the scallops and now the suspension systems which are the suspension systems these are the cordy and papillary muscles are regarded as the suspension systems so the redefined functional classification it is based on the carpenter's functional classification plus segmental analysis of the leaflet dysfunction and the functional classification of the valve bridges allows the echocardiographer to assess and localize valvular dysfunction and it provides the valuable information to the surgeon who can then proceed a full inventory of the lesions in the areas where a dysfunction has been identified so characteristics of the normal valve is the free edge of the two leaflets are well positioned 5 to 10 mm below the plane of orifice this is very important and the height of the anterior leaflet is usually average 23 mm and these some um, these are some pictorial to measure the length of aml length of pml and you can see this is the cooptation depth you have to draw an imaginary line along the annulus then uh, identify the point of cooptation then me uh, measure this depth this is the cooptation depth and this is the cooptation length or cooptation height this is important for normal valve it is the 5 to 9 mm in length and this is the length of the posterior leaflet 10 anterior leaflet 22 for normal individuals and this is another picture of the cooptation height or zone of cooptation this is the pictorial to see the zone of cooptation very important so i have emphasized by several slides the surface of cooptation ensures the competency of the valve during cyst regardless of physiological variations of the ventricular volume and pressures and measure 7 to 9 mm and for the surgeons their target is to maintain this cooptation height within 7 to 10 mm and anteroposterior dimension of the ratio of the anteroposterior dimension of the annulus and height of the anterior leaflet is normally less than 1.3 and height of A2 is a good indicator of size of ring to be selected for mitral valve repair. Now, desired valve diseases are Barlow disease, Marfan's, and fibrolistic disease. This is the picture of Barlow disease, bogey appearance. This is some pictures for normal valve, prolapse type 2. I want to mention one thing belowing leaflet without prolapse. Actually, there may be belowing, but prolapse when it when it, the cooptation point goes beyond the mitral valve annulus then it is prolapse so mb repair in 1990s the surgical benefit of reconstructive valve surgery was strongly established and mitral valve repair is recommended treatment for degenerative mitral valve disease reproducibility improves survival lv function freedom of reoperation so by trans thoracic echo you have to evaluate the etiology of the valve disease 
assessment of the hemodynamic severity of the valve disease, describe the anatomical morphology of the valve apparatus, evaluate the redefined functional classification of the valve lesion, comment about other valves. So you have to measure the valve annulus in two views, four chamber and two chamber, and measure the PSP. And now, decisions for mitral valve repair, type one and type two. Hemodynamically severe mitral valve, these are the class. First option is the mitral valve repair for class one and class two. This is the SECH guideline 2020, is a class one indication. And important for reconstructive surgeon whose primary aim is to restore normal function, not other than normal anatomy of the valve. And he is to ideally the line of cooperation should be 4 and 10 millimeter. If it is line of cooperation less than 10, then further correction needed. If the line of cooperation more than 10, more than 4, need further correction. More than 10, there is chance of a SAM of mitral valve. So decision for type 3A. That is the rheumatic heart disease. Valve repair is not suitable. In most cases, need valve replacement. But what is the tragedy for rheumatic valve disease? Once a valve has been damaged, damaged, the altered hemodynamic stresses perpetuate and extend the damage even in the absence of continuing rheumatic process. That is the tragedy of the rheumatic valve disease. And it is possible for reconstruction that the pliable valve with, with minimal subvalvular changes, it is possible to repair. But dizzy, rigid valve with severe subvalvular changes, it is not possible for repair. So, valve repair is possible for type 1 and type 2 classification. This is an uh, type, uh, uh, this is an class 1 recommendation. For By echocardiography, you can easily identify those groups which are enabled for valve repair. Thank you all for patient sharing. And there is some extra time, so I will show you some. For rheumatic bulb disease, 3B, that is the classical example of the ischemic heart disease. Recommendation is valve replacement. Previously, the recommendation of repair, but why the, the 2B re uh, recommendation, caudal sparing mitral valve replacement may be reasonable to choose over downsized annuloplasty. And this is an example of the myxomatous valve. There is billowing and prolapse, and there is ruptured cordy. You can see this is the elongated papillary muscle. And this is the severe mitral regurgitation, one impinging MRJ. And this is the cooptation depth and height. So thank you all for patient sharing. Now our next speaker, Dr. Shotish Kumar Parasar. He is a very renowned Ecocardiologist in the India and our good friend. Every year he is with us to give new things in the field of ecocardiography. Thank you. The first shock is that this whenever I give a, a pen drive to somebody, I always pray to Allah that they move. And because the first time is also not moving, so I don't know what will be the future of the next few slides or so. Okay, let us see. So we have just heard a very uh, good, uh, very good presentations on, say, none of the slides are moving, what can I do? They were moving there. So I think we can, The other ones are not moving. I don't know why. Okay, let us see. So, so coming to the we'll be discussing mainly the 3D echo con to consider only the mitral wall because it improves the assessment of valvular anatomy for a pre-surgical planning. And probably at present, in the current state, this is the most powerful and convincing imaging method before any intervention. Because no intervention is complete without the transesophageal echo and a 3D echo or so, uh, because it gives you the complete anatomy, physiology, hemodynamics, and many other information. And they are all interconnected 2D echo, 3D echo, 2D and 3D echo. 
so they are all interconnected because if you discuss separately then possibly the time may be shortened to most of our slides will be showing the combined these things now whenever you see a mitral ball in from a trans thoracic it's not esophageal echo you see all the days whether it's a five chamber view four chamber view by commissural view or other thing you take all the views and examine the mitral ball which which can be seen and you see the importance of t this was one case which had a sort of a a, a mild mr here in this you see and we were suspecting something else and when this patient we did a trans esophageal echo we compared with trans thoracic echo you see you see three jets of mitral regurgitation 1 2 3 which was not seen in a trans thoracic echo and was seen here and you can see i don't know what to do but at least we have shown you three jets so we'll con we'll confine ourselves mainly to stenosis some regurgitation and interventions and show you uh, some this is how a, a mv in 3d looks like sorry gentlemen so this is this is how well it looks looks like this is what has been showed here p2 p3 p1 lateral this is middle and this is the lateral one and the corresponding scallops or so this is how they move or so this is a normal mb 3d from a la la state and you see this was this one so this is this 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 slide was just to show that the anterior and the posterior leaflets move very very correctly and they do not cause any regurgitation but unfortunately it is not moving so what we will decide discuss is something about bmv transcatheter mitral wall angioplasty and then show few interesting te images only if the images move otherwise there is no point in showing these images now this is how we A, a a mitral valvular plasty is done just to show that the the 3D T 3D MV orifice is much better than a 2D mitral orifice because it goes right from the tip of the mitral leaflet and the whole of this area seen. So this is a pre endoplasty and this is a post one. We see. hard luck this was only to show the 3d image as to how to how it is done also but unfortunately it is it was booming in my computer or there but now it is not moving so can't do anything and this was a flay leaflet you can see you can see this marked anterior leaflet is completely flail in both the 2d echo and you can see here also a, a you can see a, a moving a moving picture of a flail 2d image this was a flail leaflet with a coldy also you can see this flail called the and the 2d and the 3d p2 image or so so this was a 30 year old lady no past history of significance had severe mr various etiology is put but ultimately it turned out to be a a a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet now whenever you see a cleft in the anterior mitral leaflet you must look for any congenital heart disease or so you see and this the this was repaired and it it went on nicely and so you see the cleft and again another cleft you see the anterior leaflet cleft cleft at the cleft and this is severe mr 
so after some time these images get a sort of a a strange pattern and they try to stop moving and this is the type of the cleft we see aml cleft is usually found between a1 and a3 and this pml cleft is usually seen between these other other ones or two you can see this cleft and this flex this is a mitral wall flexible physio ring the primary purpose of annuloplasty is to restore the annular dimensions bringing the leaflets together and permitting a broad surface of cooperation and you see this is the carpentier ring also uh, this and again you see a good movement of this the whole of the ring is there and you can see the complete now this is a one time minimal invasive procedure for a people with atrial fibrillation 90% of the stroke clots are formed in left atrial appendage and and it, you, rather than giving a sort of anticoagulation throughout the life this a the device is put into left atrial appendage it it endothelizes within 6 weeks and this is a sort of a watchman device which is put into this and it is a one time device and then it continues and you give a anticoagulant for about 6 months or so and then you see this device uh, working in the la appendage again we have discussed something about in, in this in ischemic mitral regurgitation and and this was a mitral clip you see but unfortunately it will not move here so this was a mitral clip called say phillies because they showed the presence of a a clip and this clip grasps the two mitral leaflets as a result of which when they grasp the two mitral leaflets when it is brought into the la la so then they produce a two orifices which is known as an iatrogenic orifice for example this is iatrogenic orifice produced because of the iatrogenic because of the suturing of the free edges so one mitral wall orifice and the other mitral wall orifice both of them can be seen now paravalvular leaks are very important for them a 3d echo or a 3d t is extremely important because we have to see their location their number shape and they are mainly due to either dehiscence of the wall or infective endocarditis they are the two main causes of a paravalvular leaks and this lady has had a mvr 3 months back but the breathlessness never improved even after surgery and you see that there was a there was a paravalvular leak here and one this side and you see the large posterior defect was plugged you can see the plug here and the second defect was this side so so you see the second defect was also this is the this is the sort of a, a cannula being passed and the second defect is also being closed and this is the this is the second defect which was closed and you see this is the cannula how beautiful you see the cannula and the plugging device in both two of these in situations both of so the why not surgery because the mortality with the surgery especially recurrent ones are very bad as compared to the paravalvular leak and you see if they reoperation how much is the recurrence rate and how much is the mortality so i think this the end this our 3d appearance is a sort of a much better thing now this was a patient who came to us with shock my goodness this is giving me a shock so this showed a a, a flail mitral leaflet anterior mitral leaflet i be because the next few images are very important i don't know how to show all the eh are a double can putting multiple clicks and these are more common in posterior medial papillary muscle which get a double single blood supply and in that case the 40 year old afghan male had mbr 3 months back reported with dyspnea and you see a, a severe paravalvular mr here you see and and here you see there is a dehiscence this is a stitch dehiscence because the stitch gave way and from the same place you can see a severe mr both on a transthoracic and a transesophageal 
and the surgeon what they did was only to stitch the small defect and no wall replacement or anything was done so this is known as the stitch dehiscence again another you can see stitch dehiscence you see this is a dehiscence here this is a mitral prosthesis and you see a severe mr and this can also be managed conservatively rather than giving a a surgical intervention now this or most of you have seen a free floating clot in ra and rv but in portici known as the type a clot the type b is usually stuck in the right at the atrium and the ventricles and this is an elongated worm like and it is believed that their origin is from a deep veins in the legs and they have caused they cause a significant more than 40% mortality and because this lady came with breathlessness it turned out to be a case of a pulmonary embolism so you can see this is a a float free floating clot from la to ra originating from the deep veins on the legs and their treatment is very therapeutic dilemma either a surgical catheter based thrombolysis or systemic thrombolysis so we opted for a systemic thrombolysis and the patient was quite relieved and this is sometimes you can get this was a, a huge big thrombus which was floating in the left atrium and you see it was coming and hitting in the mitral leaflets or so these are the this other patient came with a dyspnea and all signs of a of a of a mitral leaflet block and you see you can never see such a large thrombus there was a large thrombus the patient had no fever or no no asthenia to give suggest a, a endocarditis so he had a, he had a very large thrombus here and again the optimal treatment of this is very controversial a thrombolytic therapy intensification of anticoagulation or some of the therapeutic options but depend upon the the thrombus location and size and you see the best treatment arms are similar mortality whether it is surgery or thrombolysis 10% versus 11% and even in but the embolic events are slightly more with the with the thrombolysis So it is also done. What is done that in these cases a slow infusion of TPA is given. So the, over six hours it has gotten excellent results and lowest complication rather than giving a full dose, which leads which may lead to a embolic phenomena. This patient came with all the features of an infective endocarditis, and you see there was a complete destruction of tissue beyond the annulus, and you see the whole. involvement of the aortic root abscess or so and involving the mitral wall the nobody was willing to take him we gave antibiotics but ultimately because of this complete destruction of the annulus abscess the patient could not be saved avoid now this patient and just the how did we we avoid emergency t and mri now this was a 33 year old lady past history of various dyspepsia variable chest pains multiple prescriptions ecg is normal referred at the end stage or so and you see this was the left atrium left ventricle i keep my lv this side but this was done by our our technician also lv was normal but slightly moving the transducer they were there was a panic because they found that there is a large cystic area all around or so so they found that they, they prepared the patient for either an mri or a t to see what is the what is the what is the area what is this why what why this cystic area beyond mb when we passed by we said nothing to worry give him a glass of water to drink and and when they gave a glass of water it came into the sac and that gave us a diagnosis of a of a hiatus hernia which is not shown here but it was shown here so the what gave us a hint was that these sort of a fall food particles were present and when we great gave him a glass of water it became opacified thank you thank you so another 50 year old individual extensive anterior wall mi recurrent vt given an icd and reported for symptoms of tia so the possibly the intervention cardiologist was in a hurry 
and when the patient came to us again not moving what can i do we saw the catheter into the left atrium tip of the left atrium and in a subcostal view you see it was going from the ra to the la to and to the lv so so what was the and on the transesophageal it was here in the lv so so the mistakes done was that post procedural ecg was not done because if an ecg would have done it should it should show the paste rbbb and not a lbbb fluoroscopy was not done and the ta tia was because the catheter was in the left ventricle by mistake it was hitting the apex of the lv and this led to a a sort of a, a micro thrombi at the at the lv apex and then now the patient has been put on a long term anticoagulant because once if malpositioning cannot be corrected this is the i hope this mood because this is the mother of all cases ultra brief case a middle aged person underwent dvr both for as and mr falling surgery it became impossible to take him from cardiopulmonary bypass because of severe hemodynamic instability on any such impact and you see the the mitral prosthesis is moving normal no problem in that the aortic prosthesis is moving normal and but and the mitral flow and did not show any flow coming from la to lv it was only restricted to la that gave us a hint that the surgeon put the valve in an ulta position so you see it is put it is put upside down rather than normal normal way so what was happening in diastole the mitral valve was getting closed instead of systole and no flow was coming from la to la to lv and when the when the again the uh, the, the prosthetic valve was again correctly placed then the patient could be easily brought out of his of the hemodynamic collapse so lesson learned from this case was like commercial pilots get breath analysis done on surgeon prior to surgery or avoid a post prandial surgery thank you sorry because it does not my mistake in future wherever we ask for a presentation by a pulse doc i will not be there <laughs> thank you uh, dr parashar for nice presentation and uh, now now next presenter dr mohammad nullah pirus he will talk assessment of uh, cardiac hemodynamics by rajanas in the great best okay thank you sir i am reading it for you uh, good afternoon ladies and gentlemen i think you have got enough energy still because we are in the middle of the conference and we are also in the middle of the greatest event in the art that is the world cup and i hope uh, we haven't got that much german or belgium supporters to be sure we have got still energy so uh, we salute those who fought for our victory and um from the very beginning in the our clinical class we started reading different clinical methods and these clinical methods gives us different ideas regarding the hemodynamics of the heart and i am sure many all of you can identify the neck of this 35 years young lady having respiratory stress and edema this is nothing but raised jvp raised pulsatile jvp so if you ask me what are the prominent waves what are the descents i am uh, i will be scared of to answer the answer i am i am sure many of will you will be scared of answering this question because the there are around 200 more than 200 waves and more than 200 descents in this lady so it is very difficult to identify the waves and descents by uh, uh, simple eye so we can we can take the help of doppler echocardiography who are the things were the structures going to help us these are mainly the veins it is the in case of right side it is inferior vena cava 
hepatic vein, superior vena cava, and internal jugular vein. And in case of left side, it is the pulmonary vein. Let's see how can we do it. In fact, it, this is a very simple thing. So far, we have gone through some three lectures here, which, are, which requires advanced technology. I am telling you some basic thing, but this is very important in case of critical condition. In CCU, ICU, where we need a bedside echocardiography. We can start with a IVC, inferior vena cava. You can easily get a inferior vena cava in the sub G4 view. You can measure the dimension in the during expiration and the diameter during inspiration, especially if your patient can give a good sniff. That will give a inspiratory collapse. So if we get a patient's diameter in the expiration less than 21 millimeter, less than 21 millimeter, and the collapse is more than 50%, we are sure that this patient has got a normal right atrial pressure. If anything, uh, if it is more than 21 millimeter, or if the collapse is less than 50%, then this patient has got a high right atrial pressure. And if it is in between, that is intermediate. So that's how we calculate the right atrial pressure. This is important to calculate the right atrial pressure, to calculate the pulmonary artery systolic pressure, to calculate the pulmonary artery diastolic pressure and right ventricular physiology. So, but one important thing regarding the inferior vena cava that you cannot put it in the parallel to the ultrasonogram waves so you will not get good wave patterns of this uh, inferior vena cava. But we can calculate the right atrial pressure and other things by means of diameter and collapsibility. And it is proved by many of the trials that it can be, it is a representative one. It can give us right atrial pressure. And it is important in case of all side of right sided pathology, like impaired, uh, repaired tetralogy of fallot or many of the con adult congenital heart disease, if the IVC is dilated or collapse limit is low, that means this patient's prognosis is poor. If we cannot get the IVC waves, what can we do? We can go downwards. We can go to the hepatic veins. We can easily get the hepatic veins in the sub view. We will usually take the medial hepatic vein, and this is the medial hepatic vein showing, and you can measure this medial hepatic vein diameter. And you can also put a pass wave Doppler in the middle hepatic vein. This will give some wave patterns. It is mainly the negative wave patterns. Some S wave, which corresponds with the systole, ventricular systole, D for diastole, ventricular diastole, and a A, which is the atrial systole. So this S wave occurs during ventricular systole, which indicates the uh, atrial reservoir function. D for ventricular diastole, and it indicates the ventricular atrial conduit function, and A for atrial contraction. This is the contralectility of the A. So this is how it looks like in real life. And this S wave corresponds with the X descent of the JBP, and B wave with the Y descent of the AJBP, and A wave is for the A wave of JBP. And we do not usually get the V wave. So this is how it occurs. And there is a respiratory variation in this hepatic venous flow also. So one of the important thing is diastolic function of the right ventricle. In case of diastole, the usually atria contracts vigorously, forcefully. In case of normal people, the tricuspid valve A wave and hepatic vein A wave are all, almost similar, uh, the induration and contour. In case of diastolic dysfunction of the RV, the atria contracts vigorously, so the A wave becomes la larger and longer in duration. By this, you can identify the right ventricular diastolic dysfunction. This is one of the features of the right ventricular diastolic dysfunction with prominent A wave and greater AR duration. And in case of pulmonary hypertension with very much RV hypertrophy, you can get on these two waves, S wave for systole and A and D wave as a single one. Uh, it can, you can also diagnose the constrictive pericarditis patients in case of with hepatic vein flow by means of the respiratory variation, which becomes more than 40% during inspiration and expiration. And you can also diagnose cardiac tamponade by means of respiratory variation in the hepatic venous flow, especially in the diastolic flow. And you can also identify the restrictive pathology of right ventricle if there's any, where you will not get that much of respiratory variation, but during inspiration, there may be a diastolic reversal. And 
in case of RV systolic function also, the initial changes occurs, the ACE wave and D waves, especially the ACE waves becomes blunted. In severe cases, there may be ACE wave reversal, even in the absence of tricuspid regurgitation. And in case of tricuspid regurgitation, definitely we will get a ACE wave reversal. ACE wave reversal in case of um, tricuspid regurgitation. In the absence of ACE wave reversal, it is unlikely to be a severe tricuspid regurgitation. So these are the features we can go get by hepatic vein Doppler. You can also change, get the change in tricuspid stenosis. You can use this venous flow for prognostication in case of acute cases. In case of ICU, if a patient has got a S wave lesser than D wave in hepatic vein, that means this patient has is going to have more uh, major adverse kid, uh, kidney events during the ICU period and the next one month of period. And you can also visualize the superior vena cava by means of supra-sternal or supra-clavicular view. The wave patterns are almost similar like the hepatic vein. Important one is it is less variable with the mechanical ventilation. And by means, by showing these different waves in the superior vena cava, you can diagnose these right ventricular different hemodynamics. Like this one, this is a normal SBC spectral flow. In case of systole, uh, RV systolic function, the SOM and DOA gradually becomes blunted, SOM becomes smaller, and ultimately there is SR re re uh, reversal. Another important thing in case of acute emergency is fluid ref responsiveness. When, you know, when a patient is in hypotension or shock, whether you will give extra fluid or not, that also depends on this SVC flow. And this SVC flow, um, in the, that uh, a term known as the distensibility. It is like the collapsibility, except that the duenometer is the minimum diameter. And if this distensibility is more than 36%, you can, you can tell that this patient will respond to fluid therapy. This is also applicable in case of internal jugular vein also. Inter internal jugular vein distensibility, if the internal jugular vein is distensible, or uh, on that case, you can give extra 500 ml of fluid that will improve the patient's um, diastolic uh, uh, shock condition or blood pressure. In case when it is not distensible, then it will not respond to fluid therapy. In right left-sided one, usually we get the pulmonary vein Doppler. It is simple. If you reduce the depth of the uh, picture, and if you give reduce the scale of the spectrum, then you will easily identify the right ventricular, or right upper pulmonary vein, which is important in patients we, this is the right upper pulmonary vein, Doppler, which will give you a S wave, D wave, and AR wave. Most important is two important things. One is the AR duration and AR amplitude, and you can compare it with the mitral valve flow. In case of diastolic dysfunction, the pulmonary vein AR is wider and larger in size, and if the difference is more than 30 milliseconds, in more than 90% cases, you are sure that there is diastolic dysfunction. This is important because in 25% of the normal patients, you will not be able to identify the diastolic dysfunction by means of tri uh, mitral valve inflow or TDI. On that case, this pulmonary vein AR can help you. Uh, one minute, yes, if you allow. And another important thing in case of pulmonary vein, because the pulmonary vein Doppler is mitral regurgitation. There will be a systolic reversal of the pulmonary vein flow which indicates a severe mitral degradation. And in the absence of this systolic reversal, this is unlikely to be a severe mitral degradation. Many of the times we fail to recognize the severe mitral degradation. On that case, pulmonary veil flow reversal is very important thing. So in these cases, the pulmonary vein Doppler is very much important to identify the diastolic function, to identify the severe mitral degradation, and to know the LA function. Ladies and gentlemen, this spectral flow of red vessels provide a window for the assessment of different cardiac hemodynamics. Careful assessment of the flow pattern, velocity, respiratory variation can be additive feature in identification of different cardiac condition and their hemodynamic effects. There are many variables of these things, and it is a very good method for assessment of hemodynamics in bedside and emergency condition. Thank you all. Thank you all for your patience hearing. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Feroz. Can we have the lights, please? No. I think this session is uh, 
So I think Dr. Uh, Tohan Hug gave a very good overview of the of the 2D spectral image, which I told you is coming up in a very big way. Because it is the first technique which finds out the subclinical LV dysfunction. Because the subendocardial fibers, which are mainly responsible for longitudinal strain, are the first one to be affected in any disease. So in cardio-oncology, number one, you see the ejection fraction may be normal, but that this may be abnormal. And that gives you a hint that, yes, we should now stop other and give other anti antibiotic substances. Secondly, in vulvar heart disease, we are all waiting that in the next guidelines, it will definitely come. Because a patient may be having aortic stenosis, may be having a ejection fracture of more than 50 or something, but the GLS may be significantly reduced. That means the patient has already got a global dysfunction. Similarly, in mitral regurgitation, I think this is being done quite a bit in cases of this, uh, cases also of the vulvar heart disease. And we hope it will come in the next few uh, guidelines or so. Then hemodynamics is the heart of clinical cardiology. We do it daily, all bedside, ICU, everywhere. So it is a very long subject. I cannot cover everything because you can see the fluid. Whenever we see in the ICU, we always see the IVC. And then we always we take an LVOT VTI. Because that gives us a hint whether the patient is improving or decreasing, then various pressures also. So I think it was a slightly uh, very educative session, except my talk, thanks to the audiovisual person. So, so I think because I brought some very beautiful slides to show the what are the howlers can be done on a transesophageal echo. So I think uh, we are already short of time, so I will we'll avoid. Uh, before the final comment, uh, we are inviting uh, questions from the audiences. Uh, we are concluding the session. Uh, the okay. Okay. Well. Okay, we are uh, we are lagging behind uh, for the next session. That's why uh, we are, we can, could not allow the question. Before concluding, I don't want to uh, say anything. But the what Doctor Sudesh Kumar Parashar told and showed in his uh, lecture about the mitral valve uh, repair and some slides on post-operative paravalvular leakages, which frequently we face uh, in our country, in our hospital and uh, other hospitals also. But the uh, non-operative uh, closure by intervention um, is uh, not being done in our country uh, because of the logistic support and the uh, a uh, uh, lack of inter transesophageal uh, uh, 2D and 3D equals support also. So we are encouraged by your lecture, and inshallah, our surgeons will also take over the echocardiographer's help to uh, advance uh, this uh, aspect of our, uh, which we are lagging behind. So thank you very much, Dr. Twin Hog, Dr. Kabir Jawan, only one Dr. Mahmoud Firoz. Only one final comment. With excuse to my speaker who posed, who spoke before me, no mitral wall repair is done only on transthoracic echo. All trauma mitral wall repair is not an easy thing. It is a very difficult thing. It is done under the guidance of 3D echo and 3D transfusion. You also do an intra-procedural. You have also to do an intra-procedural TIT to show what is has been the result of this. So I think many of you don't go back with the idea that a mitral valve repair can be done only by a 2D echo or so. So thank you. Thank you, sir. We are concluding this echo session. And moving to our next session, 
managing the risk factors of coronary artery diseases. Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure and honor to announce that this session will be chaired by National Professor Brigadier Richard Abdul Malik, founder and president National Heart Foundation of Bangladesh, and Dr. Jagat Narula, vice president and president-elect 23 of World Heart Federation. So I would humbly request National Professor Brigadier Richard Abdul Malik and Dr. Jagat Narula, please do come on the stage and grace the chair. For this session, as a discussion, we have also among us Professor Major General M.G. Rabbani Ritter, Professor Fazlur Rahman, Professor Sohel Reza Choudhury, and Professor Khandokar Abdul Awal Rizvi. So, requesting all the discussion, please join in the stage. Professor Sohel Reza Choudhury will conduct this section and invite our eminent speakers. With the permission of the chair, I'd like to start the session. And Dr. Ruhul Abid, uh, so are you in the uh, auditorium? Okay. So may, may we start? Yes. yes. yes sir. So I'd like to request uh, our first speaker, Dr. Jagat Narula. We will be talking about coronary atherosclerosis, what we know now, and future directions. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's, again, it's indeed a pleasure. It's an honor to be here and uh, sharing the stage uh, with uh, none other than uh, Professor Malik. And, uh, when I was discussing multiple topics with uh, Chaudhary Hafiz, uh, uh, when um, he had invited me to come here, we were discussing as to what I should be speaking here. And his uh, simple statement was something which will be of interest to Professor Malik. And uh, that was that something which has to do with prevention rather than anything else. So, sure. We have the best of the facilities here. We can deal with any type of uh, uh, morbidity. Question is, can we really prevent? Can we improve the cardiovascular health? So, a very gravid question here. Can we eliminate heart attacks within our lifetime? So, let's, let's discuss some of the important uh, risk factors and how exactly can we go after them. So uh, the disclosure statement here that uh, I have no uh, conflict of interest. So I've often started with this uh, slide that uh, you remember 1992 when President Clinton was uh, taking over as the president in the United States. And uh, before the president starts his term, he has to undergo the uh, uh, physical examination. And there is nothing which uh, is a confidentiality breach here and there is no HIPAA violation because everything is on yahoo.com. And um, so uh, during his examination, you will see that all the parameters were normal and uh, he was subjected to the exercise test. He went to brew stage five and the physician stopped him because the physician was uh, afraid that uh, he was at the 91% of heart rate and he didn't want to go any further. There were no electrocardiographic changes. There were no myocardial perfusion deficit. So with the certificate of immortality, he started his uh, reign. And then in 1999, as you would see here, that after every single year when he had the normal stress test, total cholesterol profile here is 196. LDL is 134, normal for those days because LDL of 130 was considered normal and cholesterol of 200 as normal. 2001, 
now he is ready to leave his office and you will see that uh, his cholesterol and ldl both have jumped jumped about 40 points now whether he was on uh, statins or not or whether he was compliant or not we do not have any idea about that and then after that there is nothing in the public domain but in 2004 he jumps back into the public domain as you see that he developed unstable angina and required a quadruple emergency bypass surgery so somebody where we thought that he has no coronary artery disease or uh, where where the stress tests were normal why exactly did he develop an acute coronary event another person tim rusert the famous nbc journalist who after having in april absolutely normal stress test although we knew that he has some evidence of uh, coronary artery disease because his coronary artery calcium score was uh, positive and he was on he was known to be diabetic he was on adequate therapy at that point in time but then 6 weeks later he suddenly died in the studios while interviewing one of the dignitaries now in the first case we did not know that he had coronary artery disease but still had an acute coronary event in the second case we knew that he had a coronary artery disease and he was being treated but the stress test was normal in him and he had a sudden death and an acute coronary event so now why is it that we have the acute coronary events we have the normal stress test but still we do not know what is going on and the reason is that the histology or morphology of the coronary artery plaques which is distinctly different in the subjects who develop acute coronary events so in this particular case you clearly would see that there is a huge necrotic core which is covered by a very thin inflamed fibrous cap and at the thinnest site it has given way which leads to the formation of the thrombus and leads to the acute coronary syndrome compared with the Uh, subject here who has got a stable coronary disease where you will see that there is a significantly thick fibrous cap and there is a collagenous the uh, core here or the fibrous collagenous core so this is a stable plaque which is full of glistening calcium as you can see with the blue arrows in this particular case so although the lumen is significantly occluded you can see that this could result in an acute uh, uh, i mean in chest pain but it would not result in acute coronary events because there is no necrotic core and there is a significantly thick fibrous cap in these cases now if i show the same picture in the uh, histology here you can clearly see that there is a large necrotic core thin fibrous cap cap ruptures at the site of uh, minimal thickness and there is a thrombus which is formed that result in an acute coronary event and on the right hand panel also again the raj necrotic core thin fibrous cap ruptured at the thinnest site again the huge con concentric uh, 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 necrotic core full of cholesterol crystals very thin fibrous cap ruptures at the thinnest site and leads to the complete occlusion of the lumen in this particular case so you will see that all three uh, histological representations here have the same histological uh, signatures that they all have large necrotic cores they all have thin fibrous caps and uh, but then there is one distinct difference in these three cases who died suddenly in this particular the right upper hand you'll see that the lumen is not affected at all in the left hand panel the lumen is moderately affected and in the right lower panel you'll see that the lumen is critically affected but in spite of the fact that the lumen may not be affected you can still harbor a large necrotic core which is harbinger of a uh, of an acute coronary or prelude to an acute coronary syndrome in these cases and why is it that you can harbor a large necrotic core but still the lumen may not be affected and this phenomenon was first shown by Glag glagow semor glagow who in the autopsy cases demonstrated that unless the necrotic core and the plaque area occupies more than 40% of the cross sectional area of the vessel the the plaque does not start to impinge on the lumen unless it is the fibrotic 
scar or scarred uh, plaque. So in this particular case, you can clearly see that there is a huge necrotic core, but the vessel has expanded outwards or there has been an expansive or outward or positive remodeling before it starts to impinge on the lumen. So now, can you identify these by the, uh, the non-invasive imaging? So here are some of the CT angiograms, one of our uh, earliest experiments that in early 2000s, we had uh, proposed that you can identify these high-risk plaques on the non-invasive imaging. And here you can see that in a person with the uh, unstable angina, where the lumen is only about 50% occlusive, you can see the vessel wall that there are two important features here. One, that there is a large necrotic core. You can see through and through that there is a, a low density plaque or low uh, attenuation plaque here, which is less than 30 Hounsfield unit densities. And also that as you would see by the yellow arrows, that there's a significant positive remodeling of these plaques. And these are the two characteristics which define the plaques, which are likely to result in acute coronary syndromes. On the other hand, a stable plaque, as you can see in the right-hand panel, that there is no positive remodeling, there is no low attenuation plaque, and these plaques are the stable plaques. So these two feature positive plaques, as compared to the stable plaques, they, are, they have a 45 times higher likelihood of having an acute event as compared to the plaques which do not have positive remodeling or the presence of the low attenuation plaques. So larger the necrotic core, larger the positive remodeling, greater is the likelihood of having an event and earlier is likelihood of having an event. Now, when you look at the larger follow-up of these cases, and this is now 3,000 subjects followed for up to 10 years' time, you will see that the high-risk plaques remain the high-risk plaques, and they are about tenfold higher likelihood of having an event over the next 10 years. However, after the first two years, there is a likelihood of some of the high-risk plaques also in a period of time they become the high-risk plaques. And as you can see that there is approximately 2% likely, 2.5% likelihood of having an event in the non-high-risk plaques as well. Now, if we have the present, if we have the serial CT angiograms in these cases, you will see that if the plaque shows progression, that is those where the necrotic core has increased in the size over a period of time, there is a greater likelihood of having an event and it is 35 times higher likelihood of having an event as compared to the high-risk plaques that do not show the plaque progression over a period of time, suggesting thereby that plaque has to progress before it ends up in an acute coronary event. However, at any given cross-section, like in these 3,000 subjects, 90% of the plaques are non-high-risk plaques and 10% of the plaques are high-risk plaques. So even though there is a likelihood of 10 times higher likelihood of having an event in the high-risk plaques, just by the sheer number of the non-high-risk plaques, the likelihood of having the acute coronary events over the next 10 years could be 50% because of the high-risk plaques and 50% because of the non-high-risk plaques, suggesting thereby that we cannot hang our hats on the CT and geography as the eventual determinant of uh, the likelihood of having an event. So at this point in time, we probably still needs to continue with the risk factors. And as you can see in this uh, inter-heart study, which I believe is one of the best studies of our time, and this was presented by Dr. Salim Yusuf, as you will see that in 27,000 subjects from 52 countries where the nine risk factors were evaluated in those who had had an evidence of heart attack versus those who did not have an evidence of coronary artery disease. They looked at the nine risk factors, hyperlipidemia, smoking, hypertension, diabetes, two other risk factors, that is obesity and uh, the psychological stress, and three protective factors like the abundant use of vegetables and fruits, use of alcohol, and the significant physical activity, it was seen that the population attributable risk of uh, these factors, which has been shown here. But most importantly, if we had the availability of just two risk factors, 
two thirds of the risk was explained. If you had the availability of four standard risk factors, three fourths of the disease is explained. And if you have all the information or knowledge about all the nine risk factors, more than 90% of the disease can be explained just by this. And not only that, wherever you are, whichever country you are in, or whichever continent you are in, the risk factors remain equally responsible for the disease. For example, here you would see that the various continents and the risk of the hypercholesterolemia, it gives you about four is to one higher odds ratio of having an acute coronary event as compared to those who do not have hypercholesterolemia. And as you can see in the left-hand panel that uh, uh, in these deciles, that as the likelihood of hypercholesterolemia increases, the likelihood of or the odds ratio of having an event also increases proportionately. Now, as we know that the first episode of uh, the acute myocardial infarction occurs significantly earlier, and the subjects who have the first episode of MI in less than 40 years of age, that is the younger myocardial infarction, it is significantly more in South Asia as compared to the other parts of the world, and specifically so when we look at India and Bangladesh, that the first episode of uh, acute coronary event occurs at the age which is at least five years younger than the other countries of the world. But then in a subsequent analysis of the interheart, it was demonstrated that if we normalize for the risk factors, we would see that the risk factors explain the disease equally well in all the parts of the country countries or the continents. Now, not only that, that there is an increase with an increasing hypercholesterolemia, that there is an increase in the likelihood of having a disease. On the other hand, if we reverse it, that is, if we are able to reduce the uh, cholesterol, as has been shown in various uh, statin studies, specifically coming from uh, Dr. Steve Nissen's group, here you could see that the plaque progression can be stopped if we can bring the LDL levels down to 70 milligram percent. And if you would like to see the regression of the plaque, you will have to go much lower than that. And as it has been demonstrated that this percent atheroma volume correlates very well with the clinical activity. And if you look at all the clinical trials of the primary prevention and secondary prevention, primary prevention shown on the lower panel and the secondary prevention on the upper uh, right hand panel, that these are various studies where the decrease in the LDL has been shown here. And as you can see that the event rate goes down significantly lower we go on the LDL. And if we extrapolate this line and we bring it to the level where there would be no clinical event, you will see that you will have to bring the LDL levels down to 50 milligram percent if you want to prevent or primarily prevent the likelihood of having an acute coronary event. In the secondary prevention, you will need to bring the cholesterol, LDL cholesterol level down to 30 milligram percent if you do not want any clinical event. And this is something which we have demonstrated in the CT and geography also. Here is a person who demonstrates a non-critical lesion, but with the FFR, there is a significant decrease. So 25% uh, luminal stenosis, but there was an FFR which dropped significantly here, as you would see that uh, even with the mild lesions, the reason was the presence of significant uh, 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 lipid collection here, and uh, you would see that the lumen is not much affected, but there's a huge necrotic core. There is a significant positive remodeling, and on maximization of the statins and addition of the azitamide, now over the next six months, you will see that the lumen remains the same, the necrotic core almost disappears, and the positive remodeling is resolved, suggesting thereby that you are able to regress these lesions over a period of time if treated properly. Not only that, here the addition of the PCSK9 in the optical coherence tomography clearly shows you an improvement in the fibrous cap thickness, a significant increase in the fibrous cap thickness showing that you are stabilizing these plaques with the, the PCSK9 on top of the statins. And that is the reason that in the newer guidelines from the European Society of Cardiology, you can see that it has been it has been suggested that we bring the LDL cholesterol levels down 
to less than 40 milligram percent in the patients with significantly higher risk. But is that achievable? So as we see that the Da Vinci registry had clearly shown us that the subjects who reach the target goal is less than 20%. So there could be a problem with the physicians that we are not uh, recommending the, uh, uh, the proper intensity of the statins, as well as there could be a problem with the with the compliance in the subjects who are on, on the statins. So it has now been suggested, and this was a very elegant editorial piece by Dr. Gene Brownwald in European Heart Journal recently, where he suggested that if we bring in something which will likely, which has a likelihood of having a better uh, compliance, for example, using the mRNA uh, strategies, where we are able to decrease the uh, LDL cholesterol level just by one shot of the silen silencing a small inhibitor of mRNA, that is the inclicirin, that is against the PCSK9 mRNA. And we started at the age of 30, that is one shot per year in a subject, quite like having a vaccination, you can blunt the increase in the uh, likelihood of developing the atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And one can add 30 years to the person's life until he develops the threshold for the clinically critical atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And a subject, if started on inclicirin once a year, would be able to live up to 100 years without developing significant coronary artery disease or reaching a th threshold for critical coronary artery disease. And that is the reason that now these investigators have started the trial with the National uh, Health Services in England, where 300,000 subjects will be treated with the inclicirin once a year or those who are at high risk. And the uh, expectation is that in the five years, you'll be able to reduce the likelihood of acute coronary events by more than 50% in these cases. So the question is that, is that a real possibility in uh, the, uh, in the uh, common or in the living human beings? So to look at it from a very different perspective, we, st we started to hypothesize that if this disease is the disease of modernization or westernization, where the cholesterol is increasing, what if we went back to the mummies and looked at it when there were no McDonald's and no Burger Kings and no Kentucky's fried chicken? Can, can we look at those mummies and try and identify whether they had the absence of vascular disease? Because 3,000 or 4,000 years, these people must have lived much better in absence of the risk factors. So we took the permission from uh, the Egyptian uh, 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 Ministry of uh, Antiquity, and we have now imaged approximately 450 mummies from Egypt, whichever uh, museums they exist in. And as you can see here, that this is the sarcophagus. We have taken the mummy out and have used the CT scanners to look at the vascular calcification. Expectation was that there would have been no disease 4,000 years ago. But what we find is that there is a significant calcification in the coronary vasculature. And you can also see the aortoiliac bifurcation, which is heavily calcified. And we found that even these subjects who died at the age, median age of about 54 years, the 34% of them had an evidence of significantly significant calcification in their large vasculature. And now when we started to look at it, first we felt that it does not really uh, mean that uh, the risk factors did not really cause the disease. But when we were discussing this with Professor Nuruddin Ahmed, who, is the, who was the Minister of Antiquity after the Hosni Mubarak's government, when we found out that these were the Egyptian elites, they were the people who were carried in the palanquins. These were the subjects who had an access to the animal husbandry and they used to consume the goat meat or beef or fowl, uh, wild fowl like uh, goose uh, on three times every day. And these people have moved away from the hunter-gatherer's life into the new style of uh, the life where uh, they were there the food was available three to four times a day there were festivities in the villages uh, in the uh, palaces where they would use the bird eggs of different sizes so what is this that was available 
to them uh, what is it that was not available to them which is, is available to us in today's day and age so we thought that we really need to go to the different sites and here we ended up in the inca culture in peru where in the andes uh, mountain series uh, these are the farmers who are in the foothills they go up and down the mountain series they are the commoners and it is the tradition there that uh, when the person dies they put him back into the knee elbow position because you have got to go to the afterward in the same position as you came to this world they wrap them in the rags and they bury them underground and there is so much of a salt in the soil that uh, some of them really get mummified and we have done approximately 200 of them now we have imaged them and what we were surprised to see was that approximately 22% of them also had an evidence of uh, the calcification now these are the subjects 50% of them they used to they they were vegetarian and 50% of them consume alpaca which is a very lean meat and um, so still they have it but when we did the autopsies in these cases we find that they had the black lungs as well and when we started to explore we find out that they lived in the shallow huts and the women inside the hut they used to cook on the firewood and they were exposed to the to the uh, indoor pollution and significant smoking in uh, significant smoke in in these cases it is suggesting again that it is all based on the risk factor the same thing in the unagon hunter gatherers in aleutian island the same thing in the greenland inuits where they lived in the uh, in the uh, igloos and the same thing that they are exposed to the firewood smoke and then uh, finally coming to anasazi pueblans in the utah arizona nevada and uh, uh, new mexico and uh, again these are the subjects who lived in the pit holes or cliff holes and there they also lit the fire for uh, 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 the uh, warmth and they were again exposed to the uh, and they all had significant evidence of calcification not only that even uh, artsy the ice man 5000 years ago had an evidence of calcification and his stomach when the contents were analyzed was full of goat meat so no in uh, realizing that we would not be able to get much of uh, the information from uh, these mummies we ended up in the chimane population in the um, uh, in the um, bolivian jungles in the amazonian jungles this is something which is uh, along the river uh, settlement is along the river manuki which is a tributary to amazon and we brought the trucks to the uh, edge of uh, these uh, forests and uh, we uh, actually did about 700 ct scans in these subjects they live long here is a 99 year old woman with her 85 years old husband and here i am examining them for their clearance for their cataract surgery next day these are the people who still live in the ancient ways they are the hunter gatherers and uh, as you can see that they would walk about 15 to 17000 steps a day they hunt for pigs jaguars and monkeys and as the meat comes in they will clean it up and they would uh, prepare a stew and they will consume only one meal a day they have some access to the wild uh, uh, plantains and uh, wild uh, papayas in such cases they live in the uh, open huts they do not know what smoking is and when we did the ct scans we found that there was rare incidence of the coronary artery calcium so those subjects who had their ldls about 30 to 70 for all their life their systolic blood pressure of less than 115 their blood sugar of less than 80 and their bmi which has never exceeded 24 and they walk about 15 to 17000 steps a day they are not exposed to any kind of pollution they do not have an evidence of coronary artery disease and if they can do that why can we not do the same and when this paper was published in lancet there was a significant coverage on uh, two consecutive days uh, in new york times where it was said that heart healthy in amazon and learning can you give me just couple minutes more uh, heart heart healthy in um, uh, uh, and learning from our parents heart health mistakes so 
if we look at all the animals in the world their uh, their total cholesterol is less than 100 mg percent there is only one animal on this planet which is proud of having 200 mg percent and that is the human not only that if you look at the electrophoretic patterns of all these animals you will see that their hdl peaks are double that of ldl peaks ldl is about 25 to 30 mg percent while their HDLs are between 45 and 50, they keep walking the whole day. And there are only two animals in the world where the LDL is more than HDL, the humans and pigs. The pigs who do not walk much, but more importantly, their LDL is less than 35 milligram percent. It is only the human which increases its LDL way beyond the HDL levels. And if you look at what the God has given us, what are we born with? you see that the children are born with 25 milligram percent of uh, the LDL, which within about three to five years time rises to about 130 milligram percent as to what exactly do we feed them? What exactly do we do? And this is the study which I did when my daughter challenged me when she was pregnant at uh, three months and she asked me dad you give all these lectures would you be able to find out as to why does the cholesterol increase in the children because we are not feeding them so much of uh, the the uh, fatty substances except the breast milk which is indeed rich in uh, cholesterol but then we demonstrated in our uh, very elegant experiment with uh, dr tom lusher who was the editor-in-chief of european heart journal at that time and dr joe hill who was the editor of uh, uh, who is the editor of circulation we demonstrated that the sugar loading in the, uh, uh, the children specifically when we talk of formula which is rich in corn syrups corn solids or table sugar in united states in western world you really cannot find any formula which is not rich in sugar and we demonstrated the pathways that the increase in the insulin spike when it enters into the liver cells by the mTOR PI3 kinase and uh, the AKT pathways produces the PCSK9, which goes out of the liver cells, binds to the LDL, removes the LDL receptors, and increases the level of the LDL, which further raises the LDL level by the endogenous production by upregulation of HMG coenzyme A reductase, putting you into a vicious cycle where there is more sugar and we are able to increase the cholesterol more and more. And this is something which we really need to drive home. We need to create the awareness in the public. We need the knowledge in the community. We need to really do that. And one of the experiments that we started doing was we created a, uh, a, a television series in uh, Netherlands, 180 episodes, which we wrote with uh, one of the very famous TV director, Ellen Delavita, as you can see here on the uh, left-hand side, and produced this show, Spungus, and demonstrated again in our Lancet paper that we were able to influence 250 high school students where we were able to increase their awareness to the level unprecedented, suggesting thereby that if we bring it into the entertainment media, we probably will be able to do a lot. And similarly now, coming in the next year, we are going with another show, what we call as Mama Mama, where we are going to be discussing about the women and uh, trying to demonstrate that the women will be able to take care of this, not only that they take care of themselves during the pregnancy, but in the next two years that there is no added sugar for these uh, children so that we are able to protect them from getting the hypercholesterolemia. So as I have always said, that the future of our society is in the hands of women who are a superior species. So I would like to end by these two slides. First, uh, that the, uh, as uh, the Caesar says to Brutus, men at some time were masters of their fates. The fault, dear Brutus, is not in our stars, but in ourselves. So we do it to ourselves. And the other day when I was sitting with Dr. Yusuf and we were having dinner, when he was writing, um, he was saying something, and I just took the napkin and wrote down what he said. And that was about the death of diseases that our grandchildren will not know what cardiovascular disease is. And they will ask grandma and grandpa. It must have been a terrible time when there were all those nasty diseases, plague, smallpox, polio, heart disease. Why did these diseases die? And you will be able to say that we took care of the risk factors. Thank you.
thank sir amrit question ever yeah thank you sir we will move to the next speaker now for the sake of time we will not take question and uh, question at this time at the end of the session okay so the next speaker is professor fazilatun nisa malik uh, she will be talking about hypertension management bangladesh perspectives very tough act to follow after that that was brilliant absolutely friends and colleagues it's indeed a great honor and privilege for me to be here today especially in front of such an august gathering thank you so much for giving me this opportunity and we all are aware that non communicable diseases are the leading cause of death globally and indeed among the non communicable diseases unfortunately cardiovascular diseases top the list and uh, and for us in bangladesh we are no exception in in bangladesh also cardiovascular diseases are the major cause of death but what is worrying is that we have a huge large number of premature deaths and if you look in bangladesh 22% of premature death and if you just compare it to japan where they have an incidence of 8% of premature deaths and this is something that we need to worry about and indeed in bangladesh the number one cause of death are cardiovascular diseases like ischemic heart disease and stroke and we all know that the underlying one of the major risk factors for these diseases is high blood pressure and high blood pressure in fact kills more people than any other condition and more than all infectious diseases combined and in the over the years in bangladesh actually hypertension has gradually risen in its prevalence and incidence and the fact of the matter is that many bangladeshis are not aware that they are hypertensive and even if they are aware of it they're not properly controlling it and unfortunately in bangladesh only 14% of hypertensives have their blood pressure under control and in a study conducted in the urban slum they found that 47.7% men and 11.7% women in bangladesh have never ever had their blood pressure measured so we in national heart foundation in different times have conducted different studies and research work and in a study where we studied very young patients patients below the age of 35 who had suffered an acute myocardial infarction and these bangladeshi population we found that one in every five of them was hypertensive and at the other spectrum very elderly patients who had very severe coronary artery disease had chronic kidney disease had diffuse coronary artery disease and we had to treat their coronary artery disease it was so severe the atherosclerosis was so diffuse that it had calcified the vessels were absolutely calcified and we had to use a rota ablation to treat those patients in those patients in that subset of patient we found that 90% of these patients had blood pressure which was elevated these last two years we've been grappling with covid and in the first wave of covid in 2020 around march april we studied the population who came to our hospital with covid and that was mainly our healthcare professionals so especially our young nurses they were treating patients and they got exposed and in those patients in healthy adults actually uh, these healthcare professionals we found that the incidence was quite low only 15% but when we pooled the study with our uh, patients who had cardiovascular disease and were getting admitted in our hospital with covid obviously the numbers started rising and in that population the high blood pressure was around 79% overall during the covid epidemic around 51% of our patients were hypertensive we took part in the may measurement month many of you are aware of this and when we studied these patients we studied around nearly 12000 patients and we found that 47% of these participants were hypertensive 
And unfortunately, of these hypertensive patients, around 28% were not receiving any treatment. Even though they were hypertensive, they did not receive any treatment. And the worst thing was that uh, these patients, half of these patients were receiving treatment, but that was not controlling their blood pressure. So something really needs to be done. We are aware that hypertension kills, but the message is not getting across to the general population, and that's why hypertension is creating havoc in Bangladesh. So what are the other underlying causes that we have for high blood pressure? Well, in Bangladesh, salt intake seems to be very high, and in a study conducted by Professor Suhel Reza Chaudhary, he showed that even though the WHO recommendation for a daily intake of five grams of uh, salt is recommended, in Bangladesh, people are taking double that amount of salt every day. So high salt intake is very prevalent in Bangladesh. Low physical activity, overweight, these factors are also now creeping up in Bangladesh as we change our habits, as the effluence goes and as more urbanization takes place. But the crux of the matter is that if you can reduce blood pressure, you can reduce the cardiovascular risk, you can reduce the renal risk. So we need, really need to do something about this. And as globally, so in Bangladesh, unfortunately, only around 14% of patients with hypertension are getting their blood pressure properly treated. So it makes sense, doesn't it, that one of the most cost effective interventions for Bangladesh would be to control high blood pressure. And uh, uh, if you could do that, you could really, really drop down the mortality. And in fact, WHO has nine global targets by 2025, and one of them is 25% relative risk reduction of blood pressure. And uh, in Bangladesh, the healthcare system is really working on reducing hypertension as well as diabetes at primary health care level. And in fact, it's such a proud moment for me to say that National Heart Foundation is a part of this endeavor, and we are working with Resolve to Save Lives, and as well as the NCDC Center of DGHS, of the Health Ministry of Bangladesh, and we have come up with the protocols for control of hypertension, as well as control of diabetes at a primary healthcare level. So many of you might not be aware what Resolve to Save Lives is. This is a global partnership which aims to save 100 million lives globally over the next 30 years. And here they have a very interesting math. They say 50 plus 30 equals to 100. Now, what does that mean? If you can increase global control of blood pressure from 14% and make it 50%, if you can reduce global dietary sodium intake by 30%, and if you can eliminate uh, uh, trans fat intake to zero, that means you can save 100 million lives, which is phenomenal. So with that in mind, uh, the, this project was uh, uh, created to strengthen primary healthcare system for delivering hypertension screening, detection, treatment, and follow-up services to increase hypertension control rate among patients with hypertension in the primary healthcare sector and to increase hypertension detection and control rate among the community. The pilot phase uh, started in 2018 and ended in December 2020, and it was uh, localized to four sub-districts in Select. The scale-up phase started from January 2021 and ended in October 2022 this year. And now the, the scalar phase two has been started from November 2022 to October 2023, where in the phase two scale-up, 182 sub-districts in Barishal, Chottogram, Dhaka, Mamun Singh, Rasha, and Sila divisions will also be included. And this is the uh, just a photo. This was done virtually in 8 February 2021, the uh, first scale-up project. And uh, so what is happening here? So obviously, you need to get there at ground zero, public uh, and uh, primary healthcare centers, and give service to the 
patients out there. So you need to strengthen the service delivery. And here, National Heart Foundation is playing that vital role along with the government as well as Resolve to Save Life. So four nurse management NCD corners are created at the Upojala Health Complexes. Universal screening is done there for the patients all who come there and physicians, nurses and other healthcare professionals are trained about blood pressure measurement and to give advice about lifestyle service. A standard treatment protocol is adopted. Uh, I can't go into the details because of lack of time, but it's very simple. The great news is that the medication is given free of cost by the People's Republic of Bangladesh. How cool is that? So this is something that is phenomenal. We all talk about Podda, Shaitan, what? But this, this will really impact the life of our population. And I think this really uh, deserves a standing ovation because it's really creating waves and really changing the scenario of Bangladesh. So initially, the uh, the patient records were paper-based. Since February 2022, the simple app has been introduced. And up till October 2022, they have enrolled 125,142 hypertensive patients have been registered at the Upojela Health care in this program. And these are just a few photos of how they have strengthened the NCD corners, giving heavy duty blood pressure measurement machines, providing the furniture, training the staff. And there's a lot of interest in the Upochela Health among the general population about and telling them how important hypertension is. And every patient is given a hypertension passport. So he has this passport that he's hypertensive, he needs his medication, and when his medication is gi being given. And if you can look at this uh, graph, it's very impressive. So they've already, as I've said, registered uh, 1,25,142 uh, patients. And the great news is that, and I'm, I'm, I must give congratulations to the all the teams here who have been involved in this soil has been such an inspiration to everyone that 59% blood pressure control has been achieved in these centers. So imagine from 14% we've gone to 59%. Uh, that How cool is that? And this deserves a big hand actually, right? This is something that is miraculous is happening and we can do it, right? Everything is not really that rosy because 14% of patients are still not under control and 27, that is almost third of the patients are missing their uh, return visits. So they're not coming back. So those are the challenges. Now, sometimes the Upojala Health Complex can be quite far from where you live and it takes money to travel there. So some patients can't be bothered. And hypertension, as we all know, is something that you don't really, most patients are asymptomatic, so they can't be bothered to be treated or to go there. So we need to motivate these patients. And one of the ways to do that is maybe bring the, uh, it to the community-based clinics, just to the villages. That might solve the problem. So in conclusion, I would just like to say that high blood pressure is a major cardiovascular risk, but the program that is going on in Bangladesh is truly phenomenal to control this. Thank you. Thank you, Adam, for a brilliant presentation. Uh, I would like to move to the next speaker. I think our next speaker is Professor Sohel Mahmoud Arafat. He'll be talking about my treatment plan for diabetes. Assalamualaikum. At the very beginning, I'd like to give my gratitude and Acknowledgement to the organizers for uh, arranging such a wonderful session. I'm humbled to present my talk in front of my great teacher, Professor Bigra Malik, also my direct teacher, Professor Fazil Malik. Uh, both of them are my teacher and mentors. So after this very informative talk of two great speakers, I'm very I'm humbled to say a few words regarding my plan of management of diabetes mellitus. So at the very beginning, you know, the diabetes is really global issue. It's very, I mean, upcoming, not upcoming, you know, sustaining risks for healthcare 
KRS because uh, Bangladesh, this part of uh, uh, Asia, is a huge has to be a huge burden of diabetic population, and many of them diabetic person carries uh, a lot of risks than cardiovascular point of view. If we see regarding this cardiovascular risks, mostly coronary heart disease is the major issues, and that is the major cause of death in diabetic population. Among diabetic population, around 21 percent people has got risks along with the heart failure. These are two major cardiac issues. And unfortunately, our women are more vulnerable, more than male ones. It is two to five folds more risk, carries more risk than male diabetic ones. Uh, there are peripheral arterial disease, retinal microvascular diseases like retinopathy, neuropathy, and nephropathy, a lot of issues. So if you look at the study that's published in uh, New England Journal of Medicine, and they have shown the how a diabetic population carries the risk in comparison with the control population. If he has got high hemoglobin A1C, if we look at the depth uh, from this picture, from the photos, that that the odds is very high. That hazard issue is much higher than uh, not uh, uh, in, if we compare with the, I mean, LDL cholesterol system blood pressure. Same issues goes in, in if we think of acute micro infarction heart failure, and stroke. Of, of all our mortalities, these are the four major causes in globally. And if you look in this picture, that diabetes is the major cause of making us pray to this uh, life, of, uh, uh, I mean life events. So my plan regarding residing in a country of uh, like Bangladesh where economic constraints is uh, really an issue. We have to plan ourselves how to deal with diabetics, not only follow the guidelines. When would the patient come to us, we have to know very beginning. It is emergency setup or some setup. It is really the emergency. It has the patient got some sort of acute hypoglycemic crisis, might be a diabetic ketoacidosis or not. If really he is a patient of diabetic ketoacidosis, we have to look for three issues. Whether the patient's blood glucose is more, at least more than 11 millimole, has the patient's ketone bodies in the urine more than two, or if we can measure ketone blood, that should be less than three millimole, and uh, more than three millimole, or venous pH less than 7.3. If all these criteria satisfies, then we should uh, think this is a case of diabetic ketoacidosis. And in this case, if we are really satisfied with diabetic ketoacidosis, we have to move on emergency plan of management concentrating on few factors or few principles, like hydration, insulins, correction metabolic disadvantage, hemodynamic stability, and find out the treatable cause or factors. This is a chart that published, uh, but this is a very busy slide. I just highlight, I want to highlight a few issues. The first and very beginning, whether you have, we have got insulin or not, we have to start the fleet in the form of normal saline. So first and very beginning, you have to start the normal saline, along with then after ability to insulin, you have to start insulin. And there's some few calculations so there, the fixed rate of insulin infusion in the form of 0.1 unit per kg per hour. So after starting this uh, emergency, very vital steps uh, to in recovering the patient suffering from DKA, we have to move on, assess the patients and further investigation might need that to find out the exact blood sugar level and uh, the glucose levels urine electrolyte, CBC, ECG, and a lot of issues which might predispose the patients to develop the DKA. And then we have to follow up the patients very carefully on an hourly basis. So the vital and more important, I have said, the registration of the circuiting volume. But it is not only sugar, but there are a few other issues which might cause loss or low volume status. Like we have to rule out underlying heart failure, we have to rule out any cardiogenic shock or if there is any sepsis. But in some people can only manage in worse. They should be shifted to HDO, especially who are young, elderly, pregnant, suffering from kidney, heart failure, or other serious comorbidities. Also, we have to find out is it is a severe DKA, which can be declared or can be assessed by measuring the blood ketone levels, which should be more than six minimal, and venous bicarbonate is very low, venous PS less than 7.1, and 
Uh, they have got potassium, uh, uh, low hypokalemia, low potassium on admission and low GCS levels and blood pressure and hemolytic unstable. So this patient is special care who might be center line, which can be treated in an age to setup. But after uh, then 60 to 60 min six hours, we have to reassess, we have to follow up them by different parameters like uh, blood patients, some blood tests, monitoring the blood sugar levels, monitoring the ketone levels. If patient is, uh, I mean, uh, improving, you have to shift the, uh, the types of fluid replacement accordingly. It's just, they're just uh, written there. I am not like to repeat this on my talk. But when the patient is resolute, how we can understand the patient has recovered from decay, we have to just uh, find out how the patient has restored his volume status, his hemodynamic stable, and his ketone lobby level has been come down below 0 0.3 millimole and pH is more than 7.3. And when we get the patient is really stable, then we have to switch uh, the patients, uh, whether he is eligible to switch to subclinical uh, uh, insulin. And when that is done, if blood sugar comes below 14 millimole, then we have to move the patient's uh, insulin, replacement, sorry, insulin replacement in the form of subclinical insulin. But we should not forget, at least half an hour should be overlay. Yeah, there should be overlay of, uh, between subcutaneous and parental infusion of insulin uh, at this point in half an hour. So after stabilization, we can switch to normal insulin level. But fortunately, in all cases are not emergencies. There are a few things we have to uh, keep patients. And basically, when patient is stable, we need a very wide uh, spectrum involvement of specialist. That's multidisciplinary team involving from physicians to gynecologists, including pediatricians. So when we assess the patients, you know, when there is no emergency, we have to look at the few points. Is it new onset? Is a child or adolescent not sure about the type of diabetes? Patient's catabolic state, whether he is waiting for some major surgery, is the patient pregnant or lactations, intracranialness, and if these factors are present. We have to start a treatment with only insulin along with ma uh, medical nutrition therapy. In insulin aid patients, if he is not an insulin uh, when he presents to us, we have to calculate calculate dose of insulin in the form of like that 0 0.2 to 0 0.5 unit per kg body weight. And when we have to choose a regime, then we can start the insulin, the basal bolus premix according to other glycemic status of the patient. So after this, we have to think. But if there is no catabolic state, there is no need of uh, starting insulin. If it is blood sugar is not more than 300 milligrams or A1C is not more than 10, then we have to uh, step up uh, in different ways. So the, we have to make a comprehensive plan to define, uh, to make the insulin manage, uh, diabetes management things. So we have to fix up the targets. The basically target so far is that we have to keep the fasting blood sugar around 4 to uh, 7.2 and post meal less than 8 and A1C less than 7. And LDL cholesterol is already, uh, we have been uh, listening to the previous lectures, so there is 100 and HDL more than 40 triglyceride and blood pressure 140 and over 80 degree milliliter mercury. So considering these issues, we have to fix the target. But problem is that it's not equal for each and every one. Because the A1C, although I have said it is less than seven, but it's not individualized. Because that kind of fee issue we have to consider to set out our targets. Why the patient has got uh, potential associated with the risk of hypoglycemia, if there's disease duration or if there's any comorbidities, there are displayed vascular complications, patient's preference and resources and support. So if there is some limitations of some factors uh, affecting the patient's management, we have to fix up whether we will go for the stringent, uh, stringent goal or we have to be a little bit relaxing in fixing up the target of A1C. So in summary, we can say that less strict control can be recommended for very young children, older people with person with severe repeated hypoglycemia, li limited life expectancy and patients of comorbid conditions. Prerequisite effort, we did diabetic uh, education. At the very, very foremost thing is we need to have a good diabetic education Medical nutrition therapy, lifestyle modification, and blood glucose monitoring is a, are the cornerstones of management. I want to skip a few slides. Uh, so all of us know that uh, there is medical nutrition th therapy is one of the important issue in the, regarding the uh, diabetes control. So what the usual distribution of food? Usually 50 to 60% of the daily calorie intake should be fiber. 
are uh, and carbohydrates, including uh, carbohydrates, and fat only 30%, and protein 10 to 20%. So these are the few models you, we can adopt practical life, it is very, as it is very difficult to measure the calories. So the hand jive system or plate models. Uh, regarding the meal, we have to fix a few issues, like that regarding meals, the carbohydrates are to be initially distributed over the day, and we have to follow the three main meals or two to three in between snacks. And we have to practice the carbohydrate counting model, what we have shown in the plate models or the hand jive models, we can use uh, how much food we can take in each every meal. Regarding exercise, all of us know that 150 minutes, I just want to highlight that we should not skip at least one in between days, maximum one day interval can be uh, recommended, but we have to try to make a uh, routine of exercise doing daily. We can do pharmaceutical therapy, which is the foremost part, which one and when. Before uh, this, taking the decision of the diabetic uh, medical therapy, we have to think of a few factors about efficiency of the anti-hypoglycemic agents, the cost, especially in our perspective, risk of hypoglycemia. If you see the efficiency, if you look at the uh, slide, the insulin is the highest uh, effective, followed by sulfonylurea, GLP-1, thiazolindin, tiz DPV-4, and HGL-2 inhibitors in the form of hemoglobin A1C reduction. Uh, regarding cost, in our country, the same thing happens. The GLP-1, HGL-2, and DP-4 all are highly costly medicine. Uh, hi regarding hypoglycemia, the insulin and sulfur are the notorious agents. There are a few other co co issues uh, before considering the, I mean, uh, selection of our medicine. Uh, sorry, <laughs> what are two minutes just I can skip? A minute. Okay. Please, just, one just, minute. Uh, sure. Thank you. So you can impact of weight, you have to think of the weight, cardiovascular benefits and renal effects and side effects of the comorbidities. So at the end, I just uh, make a summary of the everything. So uh, that is a summary slide for me, which I adopted from ADA. The thing is first, we have to assess the key patient characteristics. Then we have to consider specific factors which impact the choice of treatment like A1C targets, impact on weight, side effects, profile, a complexity regimen, and choose regimen. Then share decision between the physicians and the patients. Most important, we have to plan smart goals, like we should be specific, they should be measurable, achievable, realistic, and time limited. And we have, then we have to plan how we can implement our targets. So at end of everything, we have to fix ourselves, think everything regarding the patient's ability, patient's attitude, patient's comorbidities, and also the cost benefits of the treatment. Thank you very much. We have to beat diabetes, we have to physically active, eat healthy diet. Thank you. Thank you. So I'd like to request, I'd like to request the next speaker, Professor Mohinuddin Ahmed, new evidence conducted on Bangladeshi hepatitis patients. Uh, thank you to National Heart Foundation for giving me this opportunity to speak on this August gathering. Uh, honorable chairperson of the session and distinguished guests. Uh, my talk today is uh, about a new evidence uh, uh, of anti-hepatitis uh, drug conducted on Bangladeshi hepatitis patients. So this has been discussed already, so I'm not going to elaborate too much. Uh, we know that biohepatitis is becoming a global burden and increasingly so. In the 30 years between 1990 and 2019, it has grown. The hypertension population burden over the uh, worldwide has grown uh, almost double. Most of this increase has been coming into low and medium income countries of the, uh, uh, although in high income countries, the prevalence has declined. And the control rates are alarmingly low, as you can see from the chart. Uh, uh, the 41 to 51 percent of the uh, patients are unaware of their diagnosis, and those who are treated, and 38 to 47 percent, only 18 to 24 percent, depending on the uh, uh, sex, are controlled. Uh, and there, so there's at least a big um, um, portion of the hypertensive patients untreated or uh, inadequately treated, leading to uh, hypertension becoming the uh, uh, leading uh, cause of death worldwide, uh, amounting to almost 9.5 million deaths. And we South Asians share a big part of this tragedy, as you can see from the yellow section of the top bar. And in according to some recent estimates, this uh, burden is almost to, uh, close to 11 million. 
Okay. What, what about Bangladesh? We can see this is my dismal pictures uh, again. 27% uh, of our adult population, that is 18 plus age population, that are almost 30 million, uh, are hypertensive. Uh, 60, almost 60% 60 are unaware of their diagnosis, and those who are treated among them, only 12% are controlled. So, leaving uh, nearly about 27 million patients at risk of uh, uh, hypertension related deaths. So, we have a, a big uh, uh, onus on us to address these patients and treat them adequately. And to do that, uh, we have uh, leading um, hypertension specialists around the world uh, forming forums and presenting us evidence-based recommendations uh, for the choice of an effective therapeutic strategy as well as the, um, therapeutic uh, drugs. And all these uh, guidelines, so for example, the ISH guideline 2020 as well as uh, the NICE guideline on hypertension 2019, uh, uh, our recommendations are mostly uh, uh, given as ACE inhibitor as the uh, primary or initial choice of the drug. And these recommendations are based on big studies like Progress Advanced Hybrid, which feature perindropyl as the core molecule of therapeutic agent. Uh, for example, take these five big studies, uh, accumulating our more than 40,000 stat uh, patient statistics and uh, of a cross section of hypertensive patients. Uh, and in any all of them, perindropyl, the ACE inhibitor, has shown a significant almost double digit uh, and never double digit systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction uh, and compared to other uh, modalities of hypertensive treatment, other drugs of hypertensive treatment. Uh, perindropyl and ACE inhibitors as a whole give a better result uh, in terms of systolic and diastolic blood pressure reduction. Uh, Compared to other ACE inhibitors in the market, perindropyl gives, uh, again, an impressive, significant uh, uh, benefit when those drugs fail to control their blood pressure to target level. Uh, so these are the context of my uh, topics, uh, which is the uh, presentation of the data from the first trial, which is a prospective non-interventional observational study assessing the effectiveness of perindropyl and perindropyl-based uh, diuretic combination in Bangladeshi population of patients with hypertension. Now, the aim of the study was very pragmatic. Uh, we concentrated on two hardcore uh, uh, factors. The effectiveness of this drug in controlling or reducing the blood pressure in our Bangladeshi population and their tolerability uh, um, um, with regards to the most common side effects attributed to ACE inhibitors. And uh, 30, uh, 76 uh, investigators participated throughout Bangladesh under the leadership of, of Professor Abdullah Shafi Mojumda, the distinguished professor and uh, former director of NICVD. Um, 2,173 patients were included in this study, age range 40 to 65 years with stage 1 or stage 2 hypertension based on the 2013 uh, ESH on ESC uh, hypertension guideline criteria as well as uncontrolled uh, hypertensives with previous antihypertensive treatments such as monotherapy or combination. Uh, the setting was uh, mostly OPD-based uh, on hospital, non-hospital, uh, private chamber, and uh, practitioner's chambers. Uh, um, at the background of the patient population research, 39.2% are newly diagnosed stage 1 hypertensive, 21.7% stage 2 hypertensive, and 39.1% uh, uh, who were treated but not controlled with other medications. Uh, this was a mixture of uh, background risk factors and other comorbidities, I can see. So it's a, uh, it was a, a collective bag uh, with all sorts of patients, uh, mostly other uh, cardiovascular risk factors such as diabetes, hypertension, smoking, etc. And previous uh, disease CVD and coronary heart disease, as well as family histories of uh, risk factors and disease. The results were published in July, uh, June uh, two th this year. Uh, in the Singapore Journal of Cardiology. And these are the uh, uh, main results. Overall, as you can see, the um, baseline blood pressure was one, near 160 by 95 millimeter mercury, which came down to a mean of 138 by 85 millimeter mercury at one month and 130 by uh, 81 millimeter mercury at three months. <clears throat> Effect of perindropyl 4 milligram uh, alone on the uh, control of blood pressure. As you can see, there was a mean 21 millimeter systolic blood pressure reduction and 11 millimeter diastolic blood pressure reduction. Uh, 
uh, uh, and those who uh, were treated with pendopril only along uh, uh, during the entire three, uh, three month uh, trial period. And effect of blood pressure, effect on blood pressure of pendopril and dopamide combination, which was greater uh, as expected, uh, 34 millimeter of systolic, uh, blood, uh, systolic blood pressure uh, reduction um, by uh, 15 millimeter of diastolic blood pressure measurement at the end of three months of treatment. Mm -hmm. Uh, we are fortunate that we could uh, carry all our patients to com conclusion. The adherence rate was 92.26%, uh, uh, per, uh, that is uh, 2,500 patients completed this study. Only 168 patients were uh, not, did not complete the study, 61 were lost to follow up, and most importantly, 107 had an adverse effect, which was uh, mainly attributed to ACE inhibitors, that is CAF, and only 105, that is 4.83%, had to discontinue the medication because this um, um, nagging side effect. So in conclusion, uh, our findings in this study show that hypertensive population of Bangladesh suggests that penindropyl 4 milligram based uh, therapy with or without diuretics, added endopamide uh, diuretic, uh, is well effective, safe, and well tolerated as an antihypertensive treatment. And the results of our study also corroborate the results of previous international studies that have been um, that I have already highlighted in my uh, previous slides. Thank you very much. This ends my study session. Thank you very much for your patient attention. Uh, thank you, sir. Now we have had four presentation in this session, but for the sake of time, we are not going to take any question from the audience right now. Uh, but we have two distinguished discussion here, and also chair and co-chair. We'll get brief comments from our discussants, and then we'll move to sir, small comments on this. Uh, thank you very much. Actually, all the lecture of this session is very important in our perspective, especially giving emphasis on cerebrovascular disease, hypertension, as well as the treatment of the hypertension. And all speakers delivered their lecture is very significantly. I thank them and I also thank the audience. Thank you very much. Respected Chairperson, National Professor, Brigadier General Malik, the learned speakers, and the distinguished guests from home and abroad. Assalamu alaikum. Ladies and gentlemen, you will all agree with me that in this afternoon, we have learned a lot of things about three non communicable diseases. First is your coronary disease, second, hypertension, and third, diabetes mellitus. With this knowledge, we will be able to manage these patients in future more efficiently. It is no doubt. For this reason, our speakers, the learned speakers, deserve thanks from the core of our heart because from them we have learned and we'll give it the benefit to our patients. With this, I am concluding my speech. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, once again for patient hearing. Thank you, sir. I will go to the co-chair of the chair. I will, love, sir, I will like to request Professor Naula to comment on this. As a, as a co-chair, Comment on no, I think I will, I will have. No, no, you, 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 you want to make a comment for other lecture? Okay. So, I mean, undoubtedly, I mean, this was this was a very important session, and uh, the primary prevention, and uh, our so-called pro primordial prevention, and uh, the cardiovascular health promotion, that is uh, the key, and uh, so much of a good work is being done, and I was. Uh, in the morning, I spent some time with uh, Professor Sohel and uh, looked at some of the studies that are being done here and the data that are being collected here. I think uh, uh, the, uh, you are at the forefront here and uh, we, we really, really hope that uh, this becomes the epicenter of uh, the cardiovascular disease uh, prevention. So it's indeed, it has been a privilege to be able to uh, uh, work with uh, all the uh, investigators here today, and uh, I would request now um, uh, National Professor Malik to conclude uh, the session. Thank you very much.
Now, really, this is very interesting, a very important session this morning. Hypertension, diabetes, and atherosclerotic disease, coronary heart disease. Very important. Now, we cannot solve our problem by making hospital. Prevention is the answer. Primary prevention, secondary prevention. And to prevent this disease, we must know how it is coming. So I think if, we, if you can control hypertension, if you control diabetes, if you can control the tobacco use, then you can do, and also physical activity you can restore. You can control many things. So I must thank Dr. Jagat Narola for a brilliant presentation, and also other speakers have spoken very nicely. Thank you, all of them, and I think all of us, if we can work, we can definitely control this disease. But awareness program is very important. Many people do not keep attention for prevention. They hear in one year, go in another year. But when they get the disease, they pay the doctor and they take the medicine. So you have to inform the people, awareness program, and sometimes they become inattentive. They know, but they ignore it. So thank you very much, for Dr. Jagat Narada, and other speaker, and also the audience. Thank you very much. This is a very nice presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, all the eminent speakers and chairpersons and panelists. Now, may I request honorable chairperson and panelists to hand over the momento to our speakers. Our first speaker is Dr. Jagat Narula. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a big hand to our eminent speaker, Dr. Jagat Narula. Now requesting Professor Muin Uddin Ahmed to come forward and uh, have the momento. Yes, Arafa sir is in a prayer. So with this uh, Momento ceremony we are concluding now and it's a time for lunch break. Our next session is on cardiac surgery. So let's have a lunch break. And faculty are requested to have the lunch in the garden beside this auditorium. And the delegates are requesting it to go on ninth floor and uh, 11th floor. Lunch is serving is on ninth floor and 11th floor and faculty are requesting to have the lunch in the garden. <laughs>